gamers focus on historical conflicts. I'm your host, Ariskany, and in this episode, we continue our review of the Pacific Theater in World War II, discussing some options for wargaming in this incredible setting. If you're just joining us, consider taking a look at our two previous episodes, where we look at the U.S. Marine Corps' landings on Iwo Jima and surface gun reactions in Pacific War naval combat. For now, we turn our bows into the wind and scramble to the flight deck. It's time to look at carrier operations in the Pacific. Before we climb into the cockpit, let's look at a few characteristics of World War II aircraft carriers. In the 1930s and 40s, carriers came in three basic types. The smallest carriers were called escort carriers, often converted cargo ships or tankers, and carrying, in some cases, as few as six second-rate aircraft. Originally used to help escort convoys, hence the name, across the Atlantic, their aircraft were superb at depth-charging German U-boats. In the Pacific, the Americans often used them to support amphibious landings. They were officially designated as CVE, Carrier Vessel Escort, but their crews often lamented that it really stood for combustible, vulnerable, and expendable. These were slow, light, cheap, but built in huge numbers. And while the Navy's real hitting power came from its fleet carriers, the humble little escort carrier is what gave the Navy its breadth, allowing carrier air power to be deployed virtually anywhere across the vast Pacific. Next up were light carriers, a type heavily deployed by both the Americans and the Japanese. Usually carrying about 30 aircraft, they could keep pace with the speed and range of fleet carriers, even if they didn't quite have the same punch. As such, they often bulked out the strength of a carrier task force, or expanded tactical options for parallel operations, like providing air cover to surface combat or amphibious landing task forces. Finally, we come to the fleet carriers. These were the blue chip, top asset, ace of spades warship in any navy worthy of the title from World War II to the present day. Carrying anywhere from 65 to 100 first-line aircraft flown by the most elite pilots, the fleet carrier is the undisputed heart of any offensive naval formation. A single strike from a large fleet carrier could sink a whole battleship fleet in minutes and from hundreds of miles away. That same strike can shatter an enemy's air force, eviscerate his economy by destroying his ports, and annihilate any naval threat sent against him, except perhaps a similar formation under the enemy's flag. Which brings us to some other, less impressive characteristics of the aircraft carrier. In gaming terms, these are the ultimate glass cannons. Their incredible offensive strike capability matched only by their staggering vulnerability. They're little more than moving airports resting atop gigantic floating gas cans, and a single well-placed bomb can instantly reduce this mightiest of warship to a crematorium for thousands of men. In fact, by the middle of World War II, a huge portion of the world's navies existed for the sole purpose of protecting aircraft carriers, which are utterly dependent on the rest of the fleet for defense. A World War II carrier's air group was made up of single-engine planes falling into three general types. Fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo bombers. Dive bombers or torpedo bombers could also be used as scouts because of their longer range but longer-range scouts from land bases were often coordinated into this task as well. Fighters protected the bombers, but also the carrier fleet itself, flying what was generally called CAP, or Combat Air Patrol. The war in the Pacific was, in a word, the war of the carrier, fought almost exclusively between the United States Navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy, who deployed at one time or another the two largest carrier fleets the world has ever seen. The war started off with carriers, when six Japanese fleet carriers launched a devastating surprise attack on the American Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. The entire American battleship fleet was sunk or crippled in a single blow, yet miraculously, all three American fleet carriers just happened to be out at sea at the time. The Americans were not alone in getting bad news from Japanese aircraft carriers. Just three days later, the battlecruiser HMS Repulse and battleship HMS Prince of Wales were sunk by Japanese carrier airstrikes as well. This loss largely doomed the British garrison in Singapore, 
and more or less knocked Britain out of the Pacific War until 1945. American carriers would be quick to strike back with operations against Japanese-held islands and the famed Doolittle Raid against Japan itself. These raids did no real damage, but were vital for three reasons. One, they rattled the Japanese and disproportionately affected their subsequent war planning. Two, they had an amazing effect on American morale. And three, the American Navy was learning how to use their carriers. Even their old school battle wagon commanders forced to learn this new trade with the battleship fleet at the bottom of Pearl Harbor. American and Japanese carrier forces really came to blows for the first time at the Battle of the Coral Sea in May of 1942. This battle turned back a Japanese invasion force that would have taken Port Moresby in New Guinea, a move that would have almost certainly doomed Australia to a protracted siege if not limited invasion. But as we saw at Singapore, a single carrier action could have a profound effect on kicking a nation out of, or keeping a nation in, the ongoing Pacific theater. This was also the first battle fought entirely by naval aircraft. The two fleets never saw each other. The Americans actually took more damage than the Japanese in terms of ships, but the Japanese lost far more aircraft. This brings up an important point in carrier wargaming. You can't just track what ships survived or were sunk. The state of your air groups must be considered as a key factor in victory. Next came the most famous and decisive carrier battle ever fought, Midway. Although the Americans were still terribly outnumbered, this battle highlights two key American advantages, broken Japanese naval codes and damage control aboard American carriers. When they were hit, Japanese carriers detonated like 30,000 ton bombs, while American carriers endured until the Japanese had to hit USS Yorktown three times, and even then she was only sunk by a Japanese submarine. After Midway, the Americans were on the offensive. Yet the Solomon's Island campaign would feature a string of carrier battles where the Japanese fought with amazing skill, experience, and tenacity. At one point, the Americans were down to a single carrier, USS Enterprise, and for 12 hours, a damaged flight deck elevator meant that she couldn't launch aircraft. For those 12 terrifying hours, that all-important count of operational American carriers in the Pacific was officially zero. The next big one was the Battle of the Philippine Sea in June 1944. Triggered when the Americans landed on the Marianas Islands, the battle is sometimes called the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot because the Americans not only destroyed the vast majority of the Japanese carrier fleet, but almost 600 Japanese aircraft at the loss of just 120 of their own. And most of these were due to accidents in a risky nighttime carrier landing operation. Philippine Sea proves that a carrier force is only as good as its air group, and its air group is only as good as its pilots. Formerly the best in the world, the Japanese Carrier Pilot Corps had been ground up at places like Midway, the Solomons, Rabaul, and Truk. And by 1944, the average American naval aviator was absurdly superior to his Japanese counterpart. By the time we get to the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the tragic remnants of the Japanese Carrier Force was literally being used as bait, while American carrier strikes were mauling Japanese ships with near impunity. However, Leyte Gulf is also where we see the advent of the Kamikaze Squadrons, adding a terrifying new dimension to carrier warfare. Leyte Gulf also sees those humble little escort carriers we were talking about caught in the path of a huge Japanese battleship and cruiser force, which they did manage to stop, although only with some amazing strokes of luck and a hideous price in ships, aircraft, and men. After that, carrier operations in the Pacific were basically American flattops supporting amphibious landings. Interestingly, this is also when the Royal Navy made a return into the Pacific War, after the British won the campaigns in India and Burma. Joining as a subcommand of the American 5th Fleet, British aircraft carriers with armored flight decks were a huge asset during the desperate and bloody kamikaze strikes during the Battle of Okinawa. Both the Japanese and the United States had some historic and renowned aircraft carriers, carrier classes, and carrier forces in the Pacific. We'll touch on just a few of them here. First off, we have the Kidu Butai, the main Japanese carrier strike force. At its height, there were six fleet carriers in this force. 
powers, including Akagi, or Red Castle, Kaga, Increased Joy, Soryu, Green Dragon, Hiryu, Flying Dragon, Shokaku, Soaring Crane, and Zuakaku, Auspicious Crane. These were the six carriers that hit Pearl Harbor and subsequently conquered most of the Western Pacific Ocean. But four of them would be lost at Midway. Shokaku's luck running out two years later at the Philippine Sea. The Zuakaku was the last of this breed to finally go down at the Battle of Leyte Gulf, carrying almost no aircraft, used mostly as bait, a brave but sad swan song for what had once been the most powerful single naval force in human history. For the Americans, the most famous ship is undoubtedly the Big E, USS Enterprise CV-6. No less than nine U.S. Navy warships, plus a space shuttle, have carried the name Enterprise, but clearly this was the most famous. She was Admiral William Bull Halsey's flagship on December 7, 1941, and was still in service when the Japanese signed their final surrender on September 2, 1945. In between, she destroyed over 350 ships, almost 1,000 enemy aircraft, earned 20 battle stars, and retired as the most decorated and famous warship in the history of the United States Navy. I would say she's the most famous warship in the world, but HMS Victory is literally the only possible contender I can think of that might dispute that title. The Enterprise's fame aside, the most important carrier class was the Essex class of the United States Navy. No less than 24 of these fleet carriers would be built, until there were more Essex-class fleet carriers than all other fleet carriers combined on planet Earth at the time. After the war, some were modernized and served through Korea and Vietnam, including the very last one of these commissioned, USS Oriskany. Four survive to this day as museum ships, USS Intrepid, Hornet, Yorktown, and Lexington. When it comes to carrier operations in your war games, there are a few things to bear in mind. 1. I'm not really sure if miniatures are the way to go, at least not in the classic sense. Fleet carriers are 800 feet long, yet their aircraft strike to ranges of up to 300 miles. So what scale are you playing at? The two boards approach can work, of course, where the positions of the fleets and sorted aircraft are tracked on one table and airstrikes against actual targets can be resolved with miniatures on another table. Features of a carrier-based wargame are fascinating, but may differ from what many wargamers are used to. Forget getting visual range and, quote, shooting at a target. This is about managing schedules, launching and recovering flights, coordinating strike packages, managing fuel, electronic warfare, organizing searches, all while trying to remain hidden yourself out in the open ocean. Your battlefield will range across thousands of square miles, where the key to victory is finding your enemy just a precious few hours before he finds you. The kingpin for this type of game is Avalon Hill's classic Flat Top, where players command Japanese or American carrier task forces through the battles of the Solomon Islands in late 1942. This is an interesting part of the war, when the carrier forces of the two navies were roughly balanced, and the battles were comparatively small, thus making them good candidates for war games. However, the game is very detailed, and not really recommended for beginning players. Other candidates, like Warlord's Victory at Sea, or Hendrik Jan Simonsbergen's Naval War, both discussed in more detail in our previous episode, might be better starting points. So that's going to cover us for carrier operations in the Pacific. We've got one more part in this Pacific series where we look at the doctrine of island hopping and how this distinctive type of amphibious battle can be brought to life on your tabletop. For now, this is Oriskany, and as always, Tango Mike for listening.